today, um, so today, well, let me just let me just go to the next slide. So what I had planned out that a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing the lecture series was the following schedule, and I've been showing this to you every week. And as I prepared today's lecture, uh, which is called Weirdos, I realized that, well, two things. First, that I, I had heard some talk, and people had been asking me good questions about what's going on with the magnetic field. I hadn't really addressed that. And so I had promised a few weeks ago that I would spend some time talking about the magnetic field. And since I, did, since I was doing that, I figured, oh, well, then I'll talk about weirdo number three here on the list, uh, which are called magnetars. And after I basically did that, I found I'd almost built a whole lecture. So what I decided to do, and so this week was always a, a bit of a question mark in my mind. I was just going to put together some of the stuff that's happening. And a lot of the stuff that's ha actually happening uh, right now is to do with the weirdos. So there's maybe a little bit of redundancy there. So what I decided to do was split the script a bit. This week is going to be Weirdos 1, which is just magnetars and magnetism. And then next week I'm going to do Weirdos 2, and that's going to contain a little bit of what's hot right now. Um, and I should say, um, pretty much all of this stuff that I'm going to talk about is really on the frontier of what we know. And it may change. The story may change. So I'm going to give as best as I can the descriptions that we that are currently used today to describe the weird behavior. But but this is really pretty brand new astrophysics in the last 10 years, 15 years. So the story isn't quite written yet. So a lot of this stuff has got a lot of open questions. All right. So let's um, so let's talk about the mag magnetic field. So this was a plot. This was a figure I showed a couple of weeks ago where I just listed. Uh, the magnetic field strength of things that people might be familiar with. So that uh, if you have a compass on the surface of the Earth, it responds to about half a Gauss. If you made a voyage to the center of the Earth, you would, ex you would experience about 25 Gauss. Uh, the fridge magnet that you have at home has about 50 Gauss or 100 Gauss. The sunspots that we see on the sun, the sort of uh, magnetic activity on the surface of the sun, that's about 4,000 Gauss. If you, go, if you go in for an MRI, uh, I don't know if this is the typical number, but this is one of the, on the larger side uh, of the magnetic field that we can make in an MRI machine that's about 50,000 gauss. And then your typical pulsar is about 5 with 12 zeros. So, so there's like a, an enormous gap between terrestrially what we can create magnetic field strength wise and what a pulsar does uh, on an ordinary day. What is it go? Well, a Gauss is like a, it's a unit of magnetism, like a standard unit, and it probably is something like, this is probably, this is not it, but it's probably something like, if one amp of current passes through one meter of copper, then at a distance of one meter, you experience a Gauss, or something like that. So, I don't know exactly what the formal definition of it is, but that's, is you can get a sense of scale. How many lines of magnetic field go per square centimeter? Anyone else? Anyone else? No, I don't see, I don't know. But, but I think more importantly, what, uh, the relative strengths here, like maybe we don't know, I, I can look it up, the formal definition of a gas, but you can certainly get a sense of scale that we're dealing with, you know, millions of MRI machines. Uh, all right. So, so the, the fridge magnet, which I, is maybe a, a nice place to start, although if people who've had a chance to read the, the handout will, will have learned already that what happens in a fridge magnet and what happens in a, in a pulsar are, are completely different, but I just thought it was nice to sort of give some background. So uh, I've drawn like a cartoon atom with uh, a, a nucleus and two electrons, and you'll notice that I've drawn uh, one of the electrons blue and the other one green, and one pointing with a little arrow pointing up, and one with a little arrow pointing down. And this is because electrons have a quantum uh, number called spin. Um, it's a number that describes the state, the quantum state. And the spin, uh, that, uh, that I, uh, the spin direction of, a, of an electron is also the direction of its uh, magnetic dipole moment. So what, you, what that means is you can sort of imagine that each electron is actually like a tiny little bar magnet, very small little bar magnet, and uh, and the magnetic direction that the, at where the north pole and the south pole is is aligned with the spin. And so if you have a spin uh, pointing down and a spin pointing up, 
then you have two magnets with the, the north uh, up, down, uh, and south down, and the south up and the north down. And so the sort of resulting magnetic field that you would get out of something like this uh, it, it is basically, they, they sort of cancel each other out. So the, the, spin of the, the spin of the electrons, if they're paired, and one has a spin down and one has a spin, well, not down, a spin a half and a spin minus a half, then they'll cancel each other out and you won't get a net magnetic field. And this uh, happens all the way out. So this is the way electrons tend to arrange themselves around an atom. Each successive sort of uh, arrangement of electrons tends to pair ag against their, <coughs> their neighbor. So in one particular orbital shell, they'll be uh, anti-aligned. Uh, one will be aligned, anti-aligned with the other. And then you might have four uh, or eight and four pointing up and four pointing down. And so again, the net uh, magnetic uh, moment from the atom will be zero. And then the final shell out here, if it just has a single electron, that then the spin of that single electron uh, will determine the magnetic moment of, of pretty much the whole atom. And so you might think to yourself, aha, we've made a, a magnetic atom. But actually, you rarely get hold of just one atom. Normally you have loads of them. And so the, the neighboring atom will do the exact same thing, except his spin will be oppositely aligned. And so the net, the net uh, magnetic uh, uh, field from this bulk material will be zero. However, you can set up certain materials, and iron is one of them, and uh, what's in your fridge magnet is an iron oxide, a, a combination of iron and oxygen, and that has a particular property that it, it is arranged in sort of a crystalline structure, and we can affect how that crystalline structure is arranged by placing a huge magnet nearby, and if you, if you have uh, something like uh, iron, this iron oxide, ferrite I think it's called, um, you can put a big magnet in there and you can make the crystal sort of little rearrange itself and then when you take the, take the magnet away, uh, this sort of arrangement stays fixed or more or less fixed. So the resulting material has a, has a net magnetic uh, property and that's how you make a permanent magnet like a fridge magnet. And so, this is just some pictures of fridge magnets I found on the web. This is a cute one. Uh, all right. Oh, I'm going very fast. I need to slow down. Also, I, I don't mind going a little bit fast today because it's so beautiful outside. <laughs> Mine should be outside. All right, so that's the story of fridge magnets. And that's the this, that's this sum total of my knowledge of people who want to poke holes in this. They're going to get no resistance from me because this is as far as I know about it. So what about uh, what's the story of, the, of what's happening inside a pulsar? Uh, it is not this story, it's more like this story. And so this is like, I want you to think of like a coil of wire with some you know, source of current, driving current around the coil, and that makes a magnetic field. And uh, <laughs> uh, someone in the, uh, in, in the audience told me a funny story about a job they had uh, and uh, the production line or the sort of setup uh, that they had had uh, like a strong uh, current uh, like feed lines that was servicing a lot of machines and uh, she would put her like wallet down beside it and every now and again it would just demagnetize her uh, her credit cards because it was beside like a strong power line. So so current in a wire uh, creates a magnetic field and this is uh, called an electromagnet and this idea that you can sort of control it, you can switch it on and off by turning, the, turning on and off the current, you can just pick up a lot of you know, metallic stuff in the junkyard. So this is a this is a sort of a, not a, a a frozen in system like your uh, your fridge magnet, which doesn't really change or doesn't can't really be affected like sent easily. This can be this can be dynamic. It can be it has to be created in a dynamic sense. There has to be current flowing. There has to be something pushing the current around for it to, for it to be there. And the strength that it is there depends on how regular and how uh, stable the current is. And so um, this is how this is how the magnetic field of the Earth is created uh, in, in a situation kind of like this. So th this is a this is a cartoon of what's happening in the in the Earth's center. And so you will have sort of a magma and a, and a hot molten rock and so on swirling around in here uh, due to this sort of convective heat. And there's also a rotation around. Uh, around the, or, uh, the rotation of the Earth's 
causes a rotation of this magma as well. And so what's, in, what's inside uh, the hot magma is some charges. There are some, some uh, charged material that's moving around in here. And so you can basically think of that as a, as a current going around. And it's, it's, it's more or less disordered. And the only, like the convective stuff is pretty disordered. And the only thing that sort of imparts large scale order to the system is the rotation. And so that, that helps to kind of keep, the, uh, keep a certain order to the, uh, to the directions of, of the charges. And so you end up with, uh, with the large scale uh, magnetic field that we see in the Earth, which is not cool. <laughs> uh, and uh, these are pictures I showed uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about um, the sun and, and, and stellar evolution and all of that good stuff. And uh, I told you that there was a convective zone in, in, in the sun where you know, the, the hydrogen gas that's in the sun is like swirling around, being heated by the, the hot fusion action that's happening in the core. And this swirling around, coupled with the different the rotation of the, the sun, which, orbits, which uh, rotates about tw um, the outer equator orbits about 26 days, once every 26 days. And there is differential rotation. There is like, so inner layers don't necessarily orbit at the same speed as the outer layers. And so all of that has, has an effect of, of uh, pushing the charges around and, and you end up with, with twisted, uh, twisted magnetic field lines which produce sunspots and, and prominences and, and, and all that, that magnetic activity you see on the Earth. Sorry, on the Sun. Um, so, what about pulsars? So, what, what's going on with pulsars? Now, you, you'll remember, uh, I hope you remember that a, a neutron star ha has no uh, fusion going on. I told you it was a big ball of neutrons and it's sort of locked in uh, by gravity, pushing it in, and uh, this neutron degeneracy pressure sort of holding gravity at bay. And so, this arrangement of, of neutrons sort of locked in that doesn't lend itself to the idea of convective uh, hot stuff swirling around. So, so what's, the, what's causing the magnetic field in a pulsar, in a neutron star? So, so the story I told you is a little bit of a, I omitted it. It's not a big ball of neutrons, it's a big ball of mostly neutrons. And what we have, did I skip a slide there? Big ball of neutrons, yeah. And I told you, yeah, exactly that. The uh, neutrons are, are uh, resistant collapse because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, and this I call the generacy pressure. And I hope everybody knows what that is now after I've talked about it. But the story is that it's not entirely neutrons. It's, uh, why are you so, why is there, come on. So it's a big ball of mostly neutrons, and to the best of our knowledge, it's in this proportion. Eight parts neutron, one part proton, and one part electron. And so the positive charge of the proton and the negative charge of the proton mean that overall the net charge is zero. And um, what have I written here? Like the neutrons, the protons and electrons are fully degenerate. So so this idea that they're degenerate means that the, all the quantum states are filled. There's no ability to excite or, or, or move into any un, un, unfilled states. All the states are filled for by both the protons and the electrons. And so this, uh, this is an important thing. Uh, that the degeneracy of the protons protects, protects against neutron decay. So neutrons, if you just have an isolated neutron in the lab somewhere, after about 15 minutes, it decides, I want to be a proton. And it converts to a proton by spitting out a, by spitting out a, a, a positron, which takes a, no, it would spit out an electron, that's right. It sends out a negative charge, and then it can inhabit a positive charge, like the proton, and therefore the net charge is zero. So electron, uh, neutrons like to decay. And so these neutrons would love to decay, except because all the proton states are filled, they can't do it. They, 
they, they, they, if they want to become a proton, they would have to, you know, enter the proton degeneracy realm, and the protons are like, no, no, no room at the end, we're completely full. And so the neutrons are going to stay uh, where they're at. The electrons uh, have essentially no resistivity. So currents that flow in here essentially flow forever. And that's because, again, there's, there's no kind of way to sort of excite them or to make them bump into stuff or bump into themselves or encounter any sort of resistance because all their bodies are going, uh, if, they, if there is a current flowing, they're all flowing together and there's essentially no way to, to sort of uh, disrupt that. It's, it's perfectly uh, resist resistance free and that's because, again, they're all occupying all the possible levels that they can be in and all the possible states they can be in are all filled up. And uh, so, there we go. So electrical currents that are set up in the neutron star almost never decay, and, and they support the uh, they support the magnetic field. Now, um, for people who maybe are familiar with electrical circuits and whatnot, the idea that we have I mean this is enough for anybody if they should be satisfied with this, but for people who are maybe a bit unsatisfied, you can think about the neutron star as being an, an LR circuit. So that's a circuit with a resistor and, a, and an inductor with a current flowing through it. And people who, who solve uh, 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 systems of uh, circuits like this will tell you that the current over time exponentially decays. So this is the exponential decay. And the rate of exponential decay is the resistance over the inductance. And because the resistance is essentially zero, the time for the current to decay is, all, is like the age of the universe, or almost the age of the universe. And so if you manage to get uh, currents flowing uh, in this system, they decay incredibly slowly, and essentially they don't decay. So, so that's, that's the story. And uh, people, so you know, what I said at the start of the lecture, about how this is like on the frontier of, of, uh, of our knowledge, and, and it really is like this is still something. And there, are, you know, there are papers out there, and people will argue that there's different scenarios at, at play. But this is the kind of most widely accepted, and it's difficult. It's difficult to sort of really answer what's happening because we don't have a one and a half solar mass ball of neutrons in the laboratory to play with. So people have people have done them. Um, numerical simulations and they've, they've put in everything that they, all the ingredients that they think they could get and the field the field that they get out of the pull out of the system like the, the neutron star is a system which has an internal magnetic field that sort of spirals around but doesn't exit uh, it's a toroidal field that spirals around inside the neutron star and, and that field doesn't exit and then a, a poloidal field that comes out like a bar magnet so this is sort of a cross section of um, of this, and so this blue region is the toroidal component go that goes around it, but doesn't escape the star. And then toroidal, and then this is a toroidal field that comes out. And this field is supported by the currents. And I'm going to talk about th this situation a little bit more when I talk about. Is the blue the current there, or sure. no? The, the blue is just the, the field lines that are. Uh, that are spiraling around, the magnetic field lines are spiraling around but not uh, leaving. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But, uh, but now we're going to talk about something that I can't believe we're on week five and we haven't talked about. And maybe I've alluded to it, uh, but it's kind of, I don't know, when I was thinking about how to set up the lectures, I always felt like, oh, I'll get to this next week, I'll get to this next week. And it's sort of preposterous that you haven't seen this. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit, of, uh, quite a bit about what's called the PP dot diagram. But before we look at that, you have to know what P dot is. And so this is the frequency of the crab. So the, 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 the pulsar that's in there that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, it's called the crab pulsar. It has, a it has a frequency of about 30 times a second, or 30, a period of 33 milliseconds. And this is that so that rotational frequency uh, over uh, 26 years from 1988 until probably today, 2004. And so we can see that over 26 years, the frequency of rotation has slowed ever so slightly from about 30 times a second 
to 29.7 times a second. And that loss of energy, that loss of rotational energy that's, that you can sort of read off this curve, that is the energy that powers this blue glow and the pulsations and all the particles and all the mad uh, activity we talked about a couple of weeks ago. The energy source that's needed to make the pulsar wind nebula and to make the emission, that's the energy source that you can get when you are spinning something as 40 times heavier than the sun at 30 times a second and then over time it spins at 29.7 times a second. So there's a huge amount of energy in a system like that and you can tap that energy and you can make the craft nebula glow awesome. So the rotation of the craft has increased by, that's 35 microseconds uh, in 26 years. Has decreased. Decreased, sorry. The, the rotation period, no, the rotation period has increased. Oh, yeah. The rotation period has increased uh, by, by that much in 26 seconds. So, one thing which, uh, which uh, astrophysicists like to do is they like to plot on a plot what the period is. So, this number, thir this number uh, say, 33 uh, milliseconds. So 30 uh, milliseconds against the rate of change of the period. So plot the period and the rate of change of the period um, on a plot. And this is called the PP dot diagram. And this is like the most important diagram in this whole series of talks. Huzzah. Um, and I once saw somebody give a talk about this. I forget who it was. But literally, they stood up for a whole hour and just pointed at this plot and, and pointed out various features of this plot and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful plot. So what you see here is the period in seconds. So this is like 10, uh, what was that be? Uh, uh, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, a second, 10 seconds. So this is the period. And this is the period slowdown. So how many seconds does your period change per second. <laughs> so it actually has no units because it's second over second over second, but 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 uh, we leave it as seconds over seconds. So how many sec by how many seconds does your period change per second? And so they're very small numbers, 10 to the minus 10 down to 10 to the minus 20. But these guys up here, the guys that are up here are spinning down the fastest, and the guys down here are spinning down the slowest. Alright? Now, if there are some curves, uh, lines that are drawn on here, and uh, these tell you, I don't want to go into this, but you can basically infer the age of the pulsar <coughs> by asking which line are you closest to. I don't want to go into it, but it's, it's not too difficult. So the younger guys, the newest born pulsars, uh, live higher up the plot, and as they get older, they move down. And the magnetic field strength goes in other direction. Come on now. There we go. So the, the weakest magnetic field uh, pulsars are down here, and as you move up this direction, you get stronger and stronger magnetic fields. And uh, the two guys that we, sh we, we talked about a couple of days ago that are young and have nebulas and are really bright, the crab and Vela, that's those two dudes over there. So they have periods of a, you know, 30 milliseconds or 80 milliseconds. They have ages of about a thousand years. Or, well, it's not the true age; it's what's called the characteristic age. But we know from actually when this thing exploded in 1054. So that's about a thousand years old. So the the true age that we can measure when we actually have like historical record of when the supernova remnant happened, and the age that we infer from how it spins down coincide relatively well. Yes, sir? How do you rationalize a regression line from that scatter diagram? A regression diagram? Regression line. A regression line. You're showing the lines. I, I, How do you get it from that? I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> 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 I, 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 we can come back to it later, maybe. But, well, when I, you know, I mean, that, that's a random walk. Well, I'm looking at right there. well, so the, basically, depends where you're born. <laughs> like, if, if you're born over here, and then as you get older, you go over this way, 
And if you're born over here, then as you go older, you go this way. And so, so where the where the bulk of the pulsar population is now? Okay, so I again, you're, you're rushing me. I'm not ready to talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I want to point out a few things. This this is your bulk pulsar population, your average typical radio pulsar, of which there are about two thousand, two and a half thousand. Now that's those guys in there. They're typically, you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years old. They have a magnetic field strength of about 10 to the 12 gauss. And their periods are somewhere between a few sec uh, uh, a second and a few seconds either way. So that's average pulsar. And the spectacular guys that uh, are very new and very bright uh, sort of live up here. Now you're going to see there's another one of my talking about. What's next? So the young guys, the newly born guys, uh, live over here, more or less, and you'll see that uh, some of these have um, have uh, little diamonds, and that's to symbolize that they are gamma ray pulsars. And uh, you might remember I showed the gamma ray emission scenario some two weeks ago. And so if you're very very energetic, you can you you have enough energy to pop out like gamma rays. And so the gamma ray pulsars uh, are up here, and as they age, the gamma ray power of, you know, the ability to fire off gamma rays is lost, and you end up as a, as a regular radio pulsar. Uh, yep, this is the bulk radio pulsar population here. These guys, what are they doing? So th this rogue group over here are spinning incredibly fast. So these are spinning with a few millisecond periods. And they're um, spin down, so how fast they slow down is tiny. So they're spinning very fast and not slowing down at all. And they are old, they're, you know, millions and of, hundreds of millions of years old. And their magnetic fields are weak. They're 10 pounds, of course, they're mega strong by freak magnet standards. But compared to their buddies up here, they're, you know, a thousand times weaker. So that's one population, and that's a population that we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, in Weirdos 2. And then there's these guys up here. What are they doing? This is what we're talking about today. They have long periods, 10 seconds almost, and their magnetic fields are 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15 counts. So th this is this is the big picture of pulsars, and maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll satisfy you about how you can go from one to the other. Uh, now, one thing you can already sort of understand, if you think about these guys that are, uh, I don't know, we won't talk about that yet. That's, that's, that's. So, so to remind everybody about uh, the young pulsars, they're, oh, they're fast pinning. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have believed it? Fast spinning, periods a little bit less than a second. They spin down uh, relatively fast, so they're, they're high enough on the spin down. They're bright pulsars with nebula, and they have glitches. So this is maybe a weird fact that I haven't talked about. So what's a glitch? So the, the plot that I showed you of uh, the crab spinning down, this is a plot of the, the Vela pulsar spinning down. So you can see that over the period of 14 years, it's changed its rotation frequency from 11.25.205 hertz to 11.204 hertz over 14 years. And if you look at this uh, line, it looks like a perfectly uh, clear line. But if you if you put a line on there and then look at the residuals, what you see is this. So about every four or five years, the period, the frequency jumps up, so it spins faster. Suddenly it's spinning at a certain amount and then it spins faster, and then the spin slows down again and sort of stabilizes, and then it suddenly spins faster and then slows down and st uh, stabilizes, and then it suddenly spins faster. So a sudden increase 
and no, I should say, assume the increase in the rotation frequency, not the rotation period, followed by a gradual return. <coughs> and there are many open questions. So what causes them to glitch? This is a big question. We don't know the answer to this question. This is the frontier of our knowledge. Then we have ideas, but it's, it's very hard to, uh, to, to nail this down. So the, some idea. the best idea is on the next slide. <laughs> All right, so our cartoon of our big ball of neutrons. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't quite look like that. It looks more like this. This is what we, this is. So we will have basically like everything, like the Earth, like the Sun, like everything, the, the density is the highest in the center because that's where the gravitational strength is the highest and packs things in. So, this, so you can think of this as layers of uh, increasing or decreasing density. So we will have some sort of crust, like a neutron crust uh, on the outside, and then what's called a superfluid. So this is, a, this is that the neutrons Again, it's related to the fact that they're fully degenerate. They don't bump into each other. They uh, sort of occupy their space in their quantum state, and they don't let anybody perturb that. And that makes them a superfluid, which is a fluid that has no resistive properties. So if you put a superfluid in a bucket and spun it, spun it around, it would just spin forever. Nothing will slow it down. And that's a superfluid. And then the protons that are, there are protons that are up here. There are, but the protons that are at this level are superconducting protons, which means that they manage to conduct electricity with no resistance. And then what's happening deep in the center of the neutron star, we don't know. Because the, the, really the, 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 the density uh, in that region is so high that weird stuff could happen. Like there could be, like a, there's quarks, like the strange quark, uh, and so on. And, and so, uh, Nucleons made of weird arrangements of quarks could live in here, for example. So rather than, rather than uh, protons and neutrons, which are made from up and down quarks, you can have a situation where, where you might have a weird uh, nucleon that's made from strange and charm quarks or whatever. So this is like a big question mark because, or you, yeah. yeah this, and so people write, you know, long books about what might be going on in, in this region. But one thing that we're pretty confident about, for sure, is that it is sort of segmented. There, there are going to be different states of stuff happening at different layers. How can you have that with superfluidity? How can you have that with superfluidity? Well, well, I don't exactly know the answer to that. Um, but the superfluid, I do know that the superfluid material inhabits the crust, for example, like this. That the, it, it is not necessarily coupled to the crust, so it, it can move in the crust. So what what constitutes the interface? Then? Don't know. Okay, don't know. <laughs> but one one thing we know about superfluids uh, from the laboratory experiment is that if you spin them around, weird stuff happens. So this is just I may, only made this slide this morning, but this is a picture of a bucket of of superfluid helium. Uh, that was being spun around, and as it spins around, what you start to see is that certain uh, configurations emerge. And what these little black circles are are vortices. Really? So it's like a mini tornado. So if you imagine, like we're spinning it around, uh, we're spinning our bucket around, and what starts to happen is tiny little vortices, like like the swirling down uh, in your sink, for example, like you would see water spinning around in the sink. So we have a configuration of five little vortices, and then six little vortices, and then much later on, we get like almost a crystal lattice of vortices. And, and if you guys want a, a, a suggestion for what to ask for a content lecture, this stuff. Get one of the physicists who works on superfluidity, and they can talk about super, the properties of superfluid helium and, and so on all day long, and you can learn all about the vortices. But anyway, one, I, I don't know anything about that except that, that, that what I told you. But what, I, what we think causes the glitch, what we think causes the glitch, is some sort of feedback between the, vort, the vortice uh, behavior and the rotation behavior. That's, that you might transition from having 
five vortices to six vortices, or, and, and there might be some effect related to that, related to how the crust and the superfluid inside rotates perhaps uh, slightly, uh, it gets into a slightly unstable place, the number of vortices will change, the differential rotation will change for a second, and that will sort of decouple uh, one part of the star from another for a second, for a tiny second, and that can give you the glitch. Now, the interior of neutron stars, somebody asked me on the first week, what's inside the interior of neutron stars? I said, oh, I don't want to talk about that because I really don't know. But uh, well, you, the best that anyone's going to get out of me is what I just told you there. Uh, so we, we think that's what's happening. So that's the best idea, that there's a superfluid of, uh, of swirling vortices and there's some uh, kind of uh, sort of in and out of, um, in and out of, uh, alignment or differential alignment between the vortices and uh, how, the bulk material. How those two inches, how much time it takes? How much the time does it take for the glitch? Very, very uh, milliseconds? Yeah, I, it happens, I understand it happens within one rotation. Oh, okay. So, so. And has it been observed directly or just? Have the glitches been observed? You look again and it's going faster. So people have uh, people have actually observed the glitch, like happen as they're watching it, like literally during one observational run. What is the time resolution of, of an observation? How, how some telescopes, so most telescopes have like a microsecond uh, resolution, and so these the periods are in the milliseconds. So they're sampling they're sampling the rotation yeah. hundreds or thousands of times per rotation. Uh, what first of all. There seems to be a density gradient building here. In this picture? In the picture. Now, is, is that real or is that? I grabbed this. I grabbed this picture off okay. off today. I don't know exactly how this picture was made or what exactly it is. All I know is that it, it's showing you as time as the swirling bucket of helium uh, swirls around you. The formation of vortices comes out, and these black dots tell you the vortices are there. Well, okay. But my next question, which you probably can't answer, is. Is the distance between the vortices a fixed ratio? Yeah. You don't I don't know, but you can see, I mean, we can see the vortices here are not the same distance as these guys here, so. Well, I know, but there seems to be a relationship there. Sure. Okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was. Oh, God, we have to hurry up. You can't talk about this. We're nowhere. We have to get things. Oh, terrible. All right, we need to move along, move along. All right, so that's what the young pulsars glitch, and we think the glitch is because of the behavior of the different materials inside the neutron star. The bulk radio pulsar population, oh my goodness, uh, periods around one second, middle of the, they're in the middle of the spin down, periods around a second, a little bit more, a little bit less. Steady rotators, not too many glitches, not too many, not, no nebula. No nebula. The nebula, and the energy needed to stay in the nebula isn't, isn't here, and so. By the time you're at this part of your life, your fun days in the nebula are over. <laughs> this, uh, the MSPs, the millisecond pulsars, are most often found in binary systems. Uh, and so what happens is mass from a companion system will, uh, will add an angular momentum. That, that angular momentum, that, that transfer of material from the companion onto the, onto the neutron star transfers angular momentum, and it decays the magnetic field. This, again, we don't exactly know how this happens. We don't know exactly how it is that the falling material falling onto the neutron star saps away the magnetic field, but it must do because they are, mm -hmm. their magnetic fields are really weak, and that's why they can spin with such a slow um, decrease of their spin period. They are incredibly steady. Somebody asked me a week ago or two weeks ago, how long does a millisecond pulsar live for? They're going to live for the age of the universe because the magnetic field is so weak. I mean, of course, it's still incredibly strong, but it's so weak compared to the rotational speed, the rotational energy, that it isn't enough to slow it down until you know, the universe uh, you know, lives a whole lifetime again. But yeah, many open questions. And we're going to talk about this maybe next week a bit more in detail. In weirdos too. Mm. All right, the magnetars, magnetars, <laughs> slowly spinning, strongly magnetic, incredibly strong magnetic fields, very slow rotations, 
very fast, fast spin downs. That shouldn't be a surprise. If you have such a huge magnetic break, you shouldn't be spinning too fast because your magnetic break is, is, is big. What's going on next? All right, all right. Everybody remembers this. I've shown it a few times. <laughs> Typical emission from a standard radio pulsar. This is what we. This is how it's supposed to are. It's supposed to look. Told you all weeks, all last few weeks about why this happens. And when you have got yourself a magnetar, this is not the situation. This is the situation. So you got nothing for 20 years, 30 years of this is X-ray, X-ray emission, by the way. So you'll point your telescope at something that's making X-rays and soft gamma rays. This is gamma rays that are not very. That's, this thing is called SGR, soft gamma ray repeater. Uh, and so for 20 years of, of observations, you'll see like a small little bubbling of, of uh, low energy gamma rays and high energy X-rays. And it'll be a steady mystery source of X-rays. And then one day, for no reason, boom, that's on a log scale. So it's gone from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 100, counts per half second. Now this is on a log scale as well. So the, the, this is a 50 to 100, 120. So the fact that these things are seem to be getting crunched together, they're not getting crunched together. They're evenly spaced. It's just the, the scale is crunching them together. So what you see with a magnetar is a huge flare, and you're going to get a sense of how huge they are later on in the end, which is something that's totally awesome. This is just such a huge flare. And then you see, then you see what seems like sort of a pulsar, evenly spaced at uh, 5.6 seconds is this fella here from. This is a burst. So it lasted, you know, five minutes. One day for five minutes, mega burst with, uh, with sort of an oscillation on top. Count, this counts as photons? Yeah, exactly. This is, a, this is another guy. Uh, when it is 2004, December 27th. Again, nothing was happening for 30 years. The, yeah, this thing last went off in 78. <sighs> and so yeah, nothing, and then boom, huge flare, and again, this time they, they put the time on a linear scale, so you can see that the distance is really um, the same. And this is 7.5 seconds. And I don't know why they put the count per half second in. That's a, not counts per second, I don't know. So in joke in the magnetar community, maybe. Uh, so I should say, maybe I should have done this in the other, other way, but the magnetars, like I said, they have strong magnetic fields, like 10 to 15 Gauss, and they spin real slow, uh, seven and a half seconds, and they don't, they don't have like a pulse, like a pulsar. They have nothing, and then they have a mega explosion for five minutes, where they're, you know, where you see them. So let's first ask ourselves, how do they get the magnetic field they get? Now I'm going to return to what I said at the start, which is, this is this is like wide open for debate in the community. People don't know. Does this happen once and then you don't see it again? Yeah. These guys, have the, the, the handful that we know of uh, do their thing every 20 years, 30 years. Well, but it does happen. It ha yeah, yeah. The few that we, the, the, the handful that we have good observations of have been seen once or twice to happen in the 50 years. The first guy, that, that guy, 18, whatever he was, the one that happened, that when that first went off in the, the 70s, we didn't have an X-ray telescope. Uh, in the sky to observe it, but but NASA and the Soviets had various other telescopes doing various other things, and they basically all got like switched off. Like basically, they're not necessarily X-ray telescopes or gamma ray telescopes, but like a mega beam of X-rays just whacked them all, and some of them had to reboot. And what they were able to do, which is legend, is rather than they were able to say, okay, well we had our satellite over, you know playing around in Venus or Mars or whatever. And you had one that was you know, orbiting the moon, and maybe there was one orbiting the Earth. And they were able to time when the wave came at the, at the different uh, instruments, and then sort of, oh, OK, the wave must have come from that direction. And so they were able to point back to the source, even though they didn't have a telescope. And yeah, that's a fun. That, um, that diagram that's on the back of the handout is from a Scientific American article from whatever it is, and that, uh, that, 
that nicely uh, the, the, the text at the bottom of the other page tells you what the article is and if you want to read about it. All right. Whoa, 15 minutes to go, and still the most shocking fact has yet to be revealed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How do magnetars get their field? So, yeah, I already told you. We don't know, but here's what, here's what we think. So, during the last 10 seconds of the fun supernova awesome crunch down, the, star, the material at the, at the center of the core has a temperature that's 30 billion Kelvin. And that drives strong convection, and this is... Oh, give me a break. There we go. This is the strong convection. Now, there's a sort of a time scale that this convection can happen at. So how long will it take like a hot plume to be made hot, go to the surface, cool down a little bit, and, and come back in? How long does that take? That takes about 10 milliseconds in the, around the last 10 seconds before like the big final explosion, uh, these convective uh, waves uh, of hot uh, atoms are whizzing around with about 10 milliseconds. And the currents that are driven, like the same story in the Earth, the same story that happens in the magma, the currents that are driven in, during this period determine the magnetic field of the neutron star. But as with the Earth, there's also slow, come on, there we go. There's also the rotation. And so if the rotation time scale is less than the convection time scale, then the rotation highly regularizes the current. It highly regularizes the motion. And so if you are born very fast, so if the birth period of a neutron star is less than about 10 milliseconds, you end up with an amplified magnetic field because the rotation puts the, puts, uh, puts um, the current moving in a particular direction. And then once you make the neutron star, and all the degeneracy happens, and all the quantum mechanics happens, and suddenly the current that was flowing, now that current has no power source. The, the convective stuff is over. There's nothing pushing it. But because we said that the current has no resistance, it just flows forever. So, so the, the thing that got the current going uh, uh, was the convection and the rotation, but then once you actually collapse everything into your, into your degeneracy states, the current just flows forever and supports the magnetic field. And so the magnetic field that you get, basically how ordered and how strong the magnetic field is, depends on how ordered uh, you are at this stage, whether you're ordered by rotation or whether you're ordered by convection. And so your typical pulsar isn't born spinning that fast, and so its magnetic field is still mega strong, but it isn't as strong as the fast guys, because they have the extra well-behaved current. That's today's take, one of today's big take-home messages. Do I have a, a big red box? Yes, I do. <laughs> if the neutron star is born spinning with periods less than 10 milliseconds, we believe a magnetar is born, and people can, people are still arguing about this, but this is the best idea. Now, God, how am I going to get to the awesome conclusion? So, uh, <laughs> this is where they are. This is where we think they're born. They're born. And over about 5,000 years, they slow down to 10 seconds. And that's just because their magnetic break is so big. Their big, strong magnetic field just drags them over here. And so, by the time we get to know about them, they're 5,000 years. Now, there's a problem. I'm sorry to be hurrying up. Because this, ah, this is pretty good stuff. There's a problem. I, I, I wonder about this problem, and again, this again is people don't know exactly the answer to this, and we have theories. So remember what I said about the, on slide, what was it, slide 23, that the period has changed by 35 microseconds, sorry, 350 microseconds in 26 years. So the, one of the most luminous objects in the sky, I, I should have said that, the crab pulsar and, and the, the associated nebula is one of the brightest things we have in the sky. And all the energy that comes out all came from spinning, from slowing something down by this much in 26 years. So in 5,000 years, the time I said it takes for the magnetar, which was born with 10 milliseconds, to get to 10 seconds, the time it took for a magnetar to do that, I said was about 5,000 years. If you took this from the crab, the crab would spin down only, what was that, 0 0.67 seconds. 
Okay, so oh, I'm moving fast and I may be getting co incoherent, but the take home message is that something which dumps a huge amount of rotational energy in 5,000 years should be very bright. The theorists don't get away with this, if you ask me. The theory guys who say, oh, yeah, they're born up here, and then in 5,000 years they go over here. But the, the kinetic energy, the rotational energy you have spinning that fast, and then such a short space of time, you dump it. You dump your kinetic energy. You spend it. You've got to spend it if you want to get over here. Where is, the, where, where is that? There should be evidence of that. There should be evidence of I'm super fast spinning and I'm spending my energy like crazy because in 5,000 years I have to be really slow. So, where, so what are our examples? So people believe that magnetars power something called superluminous supernova, which is uh, what it says is very bright supernova. So this is, uh, you can't see, there's a, there's a line here. So this is the before picture. This is the after picture, very underwhelming, I know. But there's a white spot there called Supernova 2005 AP, and there's no white spot here. So this is a core collapse supernova, the same type of supernova we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But it, it was detected 5 billion light years away. This shouldn't happen, OK? People don't know why this happens. How can a core collapse supernova be that far away be that bright? Answer is, the extra power source needed by this rare class of supernova is believed to come from the magnetar created. So maybe this guy, when he co collapsed, created a magnetar, and this magnetar has all this energy that it has to dump, and it dumps it into the material in the supernova. And so what you're seeing here, what, we, what we're seeing here is not only a supernova, but a very bright, short-lived pulsar wind nebula on top. <coughs> and remember, the pulsar wind nebula was in pulse, so you can't test whether it's a pulsar we never. So where so this is just this is an explanation, but I, I get the feeling that people don't know the answer and they're trying to hide the energy. Oh well, there's these other weirdos that we don't know about. Maybe if we say this weird thing that happens and we connect it to that weird thing, then you know we can make both of them seem like they explain each other. But it's it's really it's really still in the detective work stage. But this is the best guess. Now Another important thing. Why does it look like this? So all I said was we have a big, uh, a big magnetic field and a slow rotation. Why would a big magnetic field and a slow rotation give you this behavior rather than this behavior? Let that question sink in. Why does the emission from the magnetar look so different? A big burst rather than regular pulsations. All right. Ah, oh, yeah. I can can't go through that. Basically, oh, maybe I should. Basically, yeah, we remember all this. We remember the story of the regular pulsar. The regular pulsar creates spinning around, creates an electric field. The electric field creates the, the, the plasma, the pairs, the pairs fill the light cylinder, and they all make the awesome radiation. That's from three weeks ago. And yeah, we know uh, the rotation is too, so the rotation is too slow to efficiently form a stable, mag a stable magnetosphere. So these guys, even though they have incredibly strong fields, their rotations are too, by this period, they're, by the time they get to this place, with these rotation periods, a stable magnetic magnetosphere is formed. And so we don't get a standard emission. Now there's, there's mad stuff that happens when you have a magnetic field this strong. And this is part of, like, it's partly due to the slow rotation, but it's also due to these weird effects. So it's photo so one effect which shouldn't sh typically isn't allowed to happen, which is photon splitting. This happens. A photon will just turn into two photons uh, in the presence of a, a, a field that, that's this strong. Another thing is scattering suppression. So you can imagine that you're a photon and you're going along and you see an electron and you think to yourself, I'm going to bump off this electron, knock him, and then I'm going to go off here with a, with a small amount of energy. Now, this electron is he's sitting in a magnetic field, a really strong magnetic field that dictates how he behaves. And so, if you want to knock him, <laughs> knock him over that way, but the magnetic field says, ah, 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 you, ain't got, you ain't allowed to move this way. If you're going to move, you're going to move along me. It means I can't knock into him. So the scatterings, the scatterings suppression, depending on the direction of the photon, sometimes uh, the photon will be allowed to scatter, but sometimes it won't be allowed to scatter it because the magnetic field is sort of locking it. It's locking it behavior at locking its position. 
Another thing that happens is the distortion of atoms. Fields of both 10 to the 9 Gauss squeeze electron orbitals into cigar shapes. Uh, and at 10 to the 14 Gauss, the field of the hydrogen atom becomes 2,000 times narrower. And they have a startling fact. Startling fact. The stellar field that was calculated, this is 10 to the 15, was so strong that it could kill a person at 1,000 kilometers away by warping atoms in living flesh into little light structures. So don't go anywhere near one of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> or are you going to be warped out of existence? Oh god, I'm never going to make it in the hour. So is everyone happy if I slow down a bit and drag on for like five minutes? Yes. 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 All right, well, no questions afterwards then, all right? No, uh, no long question period after. Sorry, I have to slow down. Right, so I just told you. Magnetars, slow spinning, strong magnetic field. Don't make magnetospheres because the rotation is too slow and because weird stuff is happening to your photons it stops you behaving the way you're supposed to behave. So, and also we saw that the behavior is different. They don't make nice pulses, you know, at every rotation. They do nothing, maybe they dribble away a little bit of x-rays, and then one day, kaboom. So, what is it? So the, the magnetic fields are so strong that they create stresses on the surface of the neutron star. These stresses are large enough that they can sort of compete with gravity, actually. At, at this level, at the surface of the neutron star, the gravitational binding energy and the magnetic field energy are starting to get comparable, and so the magnetic stresses can actually uh, play with the, the crust. And so large scale, re large scale rearrangements of the magnetic field, what did I say? Magnetic stresses on the surface of the neutron star are enormous, and large scale rearrangements of the magnetic field release huge bursts of energy in a short space of time. So you sort of get like a little, um, like, a, like an earthquake. Basically you get an, earth an earthquake on the star, a starquake. <laughs> So that the, the sort of surface will be kind of ruptured into a few bits for a little while because the magnetic stresses are so strong. This will cause the magnetic field to be a little, little bit reorganized. Particles will get shot out into the, into the magnetic field. And so th this hot blob that comes out of hot, hot particles that get created in this sort of star pipe, they get shot out into, the, into this field. And then as the thing rotates, we sort of see this hot blob glow. And that's why we see a sudden burst and then something that's modulated. So this is, a, this is again from the, I think this is from the Scientific American article, um, a nice um, cartoon. So it says, most of the time the magnetar is quiet, but the magnetic stress has built up. At some point the solid crust is stressed beyond its limit, it fractures probably into many pieces. This star quake creates surging electric current, which decays and leaves behind a hot fireball. Scientific American would love those using a word like hot fireball, like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it gives you the idea that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of awesome energetic stuff gets zapped into the magnetic uh, area around it. And the fireball cools by releasing, so the hot particles that are created cools by radiating x-rays from the surface, and it evaporates in a few minutes. What evaporates? Nothing. Well, the energy, the energy, the energy, is, the energy yeah, that doesn't give yes. up. <laughs> so you, you see, but they're doing their best. They're doing their best. All right. And so this is not so different than uh, like a sol the solar flare phenomenon at the sun. Is not so different. Magnetic, uh, like magnetic activity, finally bursts through and generates uh, like an outflow, and we see that. Now. The last, the last, the, the bit I've been saving up for. This, I like talking about this because it astounds me. I'm astounded. I'm astounded by what I'm about to tell you. Okay, this is a paper from, uh, from um, 98. Ionization of the lower ionosphere by gamma rays from a magnetar. A giant periodic flare from a soft gamma ray repeater produced enhanced ionization at, at, enhanced ionization at, at, in the ionosphere altitudes from 30 to 90 kilometers, which were observed as unusually large amplitude and phase changes of very low frequency signals propagating in the Earth's ionosphere waveguide. 
Now, let's just, let's just, there are people, physicists, I guess, who are bouncing radio signals from, you know, an island in the Pacific, you know, Hawaii or whatever, and they're bouncing them off the atmosphere and then detecting them at detector stations around the place. So this is a cartoon of how it looks. Radio wave bounced off the atmosphere comes down, and there is a there, the, the layer in the atmosphere that is acting as sort of like a mirror, like a radio a radio wave mirror, uh, is affected by the sun. So during the day, when the sun is blasting down all its awesome radiation, most of it doesn't get to us. Most of it gets absorbed in these layers up here, and so it affects it affects the sort of conduct the, the conductivity behavior and the altitude. Of, of this ionosphere. At night time, when we're shielded by the, earth, the other side of the Earth, the, uh, the sun's rays are not zapping it, and so it, it, um, the ionosphere changes. Now, just I only I was making this slide literally as it was coming in, just to kind of help people understand maybe what what is a reflection actually? <laughs> what is what is this, what does it mean? To be to be an, uh, like a photon to be reflected off a mirror. What's actually happening? And so one way of thinking about it is that uh, your photon comes in, and let's say it bounces a mirror, and the atoms in the mirror. And that, that's why some some materials are reflective and other materials are not reflective. And that's because of the of uh, the free the ability to make the charges in the mirror wiggle up and down. So for a second, so that the uh, electromagnetic radiation comes in imparts its energy to the electrons, they wiggle up and down, and by wiggling up and down, they shoot the energy back out again. And that's, that's how a reflection happens, and when you look when you're shaving in the mirror or whatever, that's, uh, that's, what's, that's what's happening. So the same thing happens, mom, mom. the same thing happens uh, to radio waves in the ionosphere. There are charges that are up here, and these charges uh, see the radio wave, they then get absorbed the radio wave for a second, wobble up and down, and re-radiate re the radio wave back down again. And so, the story that I told you about uh, how uh, the sun is, is affecting this layer, you can imagine that the sun affects uh, this reflection process. Now, this, let's just look at this figure here. So this is time from 10, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. So this is like a whole day. And what's plotted here is the amplitude of the radio signals sent from NPM to HAL. So the amplitude, so they're basically bouncing signals all day long, all night long, from this place over to this place. And what they have plotted on this plot is the, is the amplitude, how bright were the radio waves when they finally made this journey. And you can see, during the daytime, the amplitude is not so great. And then, as the day wears on, wears on and we get into nighttime, the, uh, the amplitude gets higher. So the, so the effect that they are used to seeing is during the day, the radio wave amplitude is low, and at night the radio wave amplitude is high, and that's because of effects on the ionosphere by the sun. And actually, this is what, what this is, is a solar energy monitoring system. That's why they're doing it. They are bouncing this all day long, and, and by looking at these signals, they can actually like do solar weather, like what's, what's the weather today? All right, in the sun. Now these dudes, they're doing this all day long, nobody ever cares about them. And then this happens. <laughs> so a zoom in of this event is here. It's five minutes long. But the effect, the effect is the day-night effect. It's this the amplitude of this blip is the same amplitude as the sun manages to achieve in a whole day. So what what has happened here? And so this is the this is the uh, this is the effect uh, that was measured in radio uh, by these radio waves in the atmosphere, and they have overlaid it with the counts from the from the from the gamma ray telescope. So there's a gamma ray telescope in space. This is how the gamma ray telescope looked. 
they saw a big flare, and then it decayed, and then it wiggled up and down, wiggled up and down. And exactly at the same time, people who were monitoring the atmosphere all day long saw an effect that is as big as the day-night effect. But it looks exactly, it came in exactly on time as this event. The inner layer of the ionosphere moved down from 85 kilometers to 60 kilometers for five minutes. How do we know that was across the entire Earth? Well, um, what do you mean by across the entire Earth? Maybe it only happened above hail. Well, I mean, what, it would have happened, um, it, it would have only happened on this side of the Earth, because this is the side of the Earth that, uh, oh, no, no, I think this is the side of the Earth that's in the, in the not in the sun, the sun is over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what was your question? Well, well, they know, they know it was in, the, they know it was in this, this signal they saw it. In this signal, okay. so this is a zoom in, this is a zoom in of, of this signal. And can you see sort of, can you see? It's wiggles, can, can people see wiggles? Well, maybe you can't see wiggles, but we have algorithms that find wiggles, like a Fourier transform, people who know what a Fourier transform is, is a, is a thing that helps you find wiggles. And so this is the outcome of the Fourier transform, and we see a peak here in this Fourier transform at exactly 5.16 seconds, which is the period of the other thing. So not only are we seeing the big flare and the decay, but we can also see the wiggles. And this thing is 20,000 light years away. <laughs> this thing is 20,000 light years away, yet it packed enough of a punch to punch the ionosphere the same amount as the sun does in a whole day in five minutes. <laughs> My mind is just blown about this fact. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And this is uh, not like I mean, this is now this is now normal. People are now using the ionosphere as a magnetar burst detector. And the other magnetars that have gone off in the last couple of decades or so, there are papers reporting the same stuff. And the gamma ray telescope, or the X-ray telescope that you have in space, that's monitoring these things, they have a certain energy range that, you know, maybe 10 kilo electron volts, 100 kilo electron volts, and that's all they're good for. But the ionosphere <laughs> has a larger range. And so you can, actually, you can actually fill in the story, the astrophysics story, using the ionosphere the ionosphere as a detector uh, and, uh, better than, or in, in some cases better than you can with a satellite that it came with. So this is pretty shocking stuff. All right, so, so magnetar emission. So we said in pulsars, the power source is the rotational energy. Rotational energy is turned into the photons we see. In magnetars, the power source is a magnetic field itself which causes the deformation of the star and releases a burst of energy. So we're almost at the end now, but I have gone way over. So one final thing, then, final thing, maybe it's a bit anticlimactic, I should have left it at the ionosphere getting punched in the face, but let's, let's, uh, let's just um, <coughs> fill in a little more of the story. This is, this is pretty new, this is pretty, this magnetar business is still new enough and people don't know, but there is an object PSR 1846 minus 0258. It's got a period of 0 0.3 seconds, so it's not the fastest sky. And it has a B field of 5 times 10 to the 13 gas. So it's, it's on the high side for a normal pulsar. And this is how it looks. So uh, you look up at this thing, and you see x-rays, a big fat x-ray pulse, and then a little big fat x-ray pulse. And that's how it looks all day long. So it looks like a normal X-ray pulsar. And then, one day, it, it freaks out, basically. So this is the nebula around the pulsar. So think of the same story as the crab, but this is a less awesome one, so the smoke is awesome, but it's the same story. You got the hot stuff in the middle, and the nebula around. And then one day they look at it and think, oh, the thing in the middle, the pulsar, that's supposed to be a normal rotating thing that doesn't have any transitory behavior suddenly freaks out. So this is like, this is a measure of the freak out, so you can go along and then suddenly it goes up. And this is over like a month. But if you look at, if you look at this data in, in shorter spaces of time, you see these burst behaviors. So it's lightning. It's like 
it, it freaks out like a little mini star quake, and then it comes down and it freaks out in a little mini star quake. And so this is <laughs> this is a high energy characteristics of the schizophrenic pulsar. <laughs> so this guy, uh, Vin Hermsen, wrote this paper. I know him. <coughs> He's a very eminent guy. And NASA had a, a like a, a feature story about it. One weird star starts acting like another. And I thought that was cool because I titled my thing weirdos before I even saw that. So the NASA guys went for weirdos as well. And so this is this is what we believe is a transition object, an object that is sort of uh, somewhere in between, somewhere in between behaving like a magnetar and somewhere in between behaving like a pulsar. And these transition objects are incredibly important because it's the only way we kind of get to join the dots between what seems to be different uh, different realms. So next week we're going to talk about it. some other weirdos, and some of those weirdos are also transition objects. And so that's um, that's where we're going next week. Weirdos too, and uh, yeah, that's the end. Thank you very much.
like locked onto the quantum mechanics stuff and they kind of want more out of it than I'm willing to give them. And I think quantum mechanics really is like long division. If you didn't, were never told long division, if you weren't taught long division as a kid, and I said, I'm going to take two numbers and I'm going to carry the one and, and do these seemingly weird steps. Like, why, what does carrying the one mean? And you guys are totally familiar with it, so it seems grand. But if you had no teaching in mathematics, and I said you carry one, you would say, why is it carrying the one and not ten or, or whatever? And so the, the half, while it seems weird just to be introduced, it's plus a half or minus half, it's just a part of the toolkit to do the quantum mechanics long division. So a we got four minutes. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, you showed a slide in which there was a magnetic field line that went out and it couldn't connect to yeah. the south the open field because lines. of the precession. Um, and so the two things. One is that suggests to me something I wasn't aware of, that the magnetic field actually propagates through space. It has a beginning where, where something makes something move and it goes along and along and along. And in that case, it went looking for what it thought was there, but it was already gone. But there's a propagation. And secondly, I didn't see anything about how any of that might relate to the boiling, uh, the convection in the pulsar, the neutron creation of that field. So could you say anything about either or both of those? So you're right. The magnetic field uh, comes out, and there is a propagation. There is a time. And this is kind of what I was talking about last week. Although I, I use it the other way. Last week, if you remember, I was talking about the, um, the gravitational field telling, the, telling another body, I'm a massive body, I'm a massive body, and you have to pay attention to what I tell you. If a, if a charge comes into existence, if, if a charge comes into existence, I don't know it's there until the magnetic field makes it out to me, and then let's say I'm an oppositely charged particle, I will, I will go, oh, he's over there, and I will go towards him, or feel the effect. So there is a time, a time it takes for a charge, or a magnetic field, or whatever, to inform the neighborhood of what he's doing, and what the neighborhood has to do in response to that. Is it speed C? That speed is C. All right. So the photon. The photon, absolutely. And what, is there a magnetic monopole on that one? No, one? no. So, so there isn't a magnetic monopole. Eventually, eventually it'll find something to hold on to. Like some other magnetic thing out there, like part of the wind, part of the wind, and part of the interstellar <coughs> field. So it's not like, it's not like, it eventually, like if you took an, uh, if you took a bar magnet and another bar magnet and put them beside each other, you'll find one, one field line will move from one to the other. You know, if you put them close enough, you'll see that. And so basically the magnetic field line will just wander until it finds, finds its buddy, and then it'll just hold on to him. And so it's not like it goes on forever, it'll, it'll, it'll find somewhere to end up. And how this relates to the convecting and boiling and stuff, I mean, I, I can't say anything worthwhile. I mean, I could try and talk about a phrase, but I don't think it'd be worthwhile. I, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Who, 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 well, you, you probably surely had your hand up for a while. Let's, let's. Uh, uh, the, um, the, um, the magnetar burst that yeah. was for five seconds that was uh, as, as great as that of the sun. Well, that comes to us on the inverse square law. Yeah. So you're talking 20,000 light years away. What would have been, is there any way to estimate what what the power of that uh, burst would have been yeah, yeah, yeah. near the magnetar. Oh yeah. yeah. So I don't know what the number is, but it's enormous. It has and, to be. And, and, and I'm glad you pointed that out. It, it, the, the spherical wave of energy that comes off dissipates as, as the horse squared. And so by the time it reaches us, it's a lot more feeble than it was you know, around the time it went off. And that's why this effect is, is absolutely enormous. Like like the lifetime of a thousand suns spent, I don't know if it's that, but it's something like the lifetime of a thousand suns spent in it. So do you use, do you use the radius of the, yeah. of, the, of, the, of the neutron star? 
I don't know if the radius of a neutron star comes into it. Maybe it does. Well, I mean, yeah, it drops off. It, it drops off as a square of the distance. So as a square of the distance from us to it. From us to it. Yeah. Roy, and then <coughs> and then I'm done. Yeah. Uh, I had two questions. One is, did I understand you to say that magnetic flux consists of photons? Yeah, in a QED, in the quantum, electro, in quantum electrodynamics, which helps explain how, uh, how electromagnetic behavior happens, the information of the magnetic field is carried in a photon. Okay. There was also a question about the, uh, I think it was slide 37, where you showed the vortices. And you said that was due to the change in the rotational speed temporarily. So the so the, the people who make these buckets of spinning helium, they they spin them, and then you know they're driving this uh, bucket spinning around on a turntable, yeah. and they're watching it, and then the vortices okay. come, and so, then they they change how many of them there are and how they're how they're arranged. So the 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 implication was that neutron stars may have a slight change in their rotational speed, and that would so cause the, impl the implication was that there might be a feedback between this rotating superfluid and the rotation of the crust and the other material, that there might be some interplay there. And maybe that interplay gets out of sync and, needs, and then it needs to be uh, resynced. And that's how the glitch shows up. That was the implication. Well, what I was thinking was that if you have a top spinning on a tabletop, yeah. uh, it goes at a certain constant speed. But if it wobbles, the speed tends to slow down because some of the energy is going into the wobble. Okay. And then it goes back to the yeah. So, well, it's a, I'm not sure if a procession is a constant thing. I'm talking about it's spinning, and when it's getting slower, it suddenly goes and then okay. it comes back and goes and then back again. The rotational speed probably slows down because some of the energy is going into tipping the top. Uh, so could something like that be behind the change in the magnetar? So it, it could be. It could be. But one mad thing about the glitches is that the rotational speed goes up. <laughs> They, they're spinning and then they spin faster and then slow down. Oh. All right, sorry, man. That's all I got. <laughs> and you, the last person. Thank you. Um, how do you get current flow in a superfluidic condition? No, I'm not the right man to answer that. Because question. normally, when you talk about the Earth, so the superfluid viscosity differences, but you don't have. So the superfluid. I don't think the superfluid is the neutrons and the protons. And the current carriers are the electrons. Because there must be a gradient difference or a stratification. Maybe. I, I, honestly, you're at the edge of my, my knowledge here. And I, I, got, I really wanted to avoid going you into the new stuff. Because I don't know. Really know. Change that. Anyway, um, can we discuss it next, next week then? Would that be possible? I, 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 am, <laughs> I want to get out of the innards of the neutron star as fast as I can and talk about all the other stuff. How can it nulling, giant pulses, rats? Legal. Legal. I'm like, okay, I should say, LIGO, yeah. those of you um, should know that this last lecture, the Hunt for Gravitational Waves of LIGO, is not going to be given by me, it's going to be given by somebody else. I won't be here the last week. So, uh, yeah. so just. Warning. But anyway, I'm, um, that's it. <laughs>